We were taught in Carter Elementary School about that historical event by Mrs. Robinson, our history and math teacher, who was also black. But that's how deeply rooted that segregation was in the collective consciousness of white society had been for decades following the end of slavery in America. Encouraged by the teachings of my math teacher and men mentor, Mrs. Robinson, I had won an art scholarship to the Chicago Art Institute when I was nine years old, and by age 11, attended lectures by myself and heard an historic speech by the First Lady, Mrs. Roosevelt. It would take the tireless efforts of the Freedom Marchers, heroic public marches, and the negative attention gained through live televised incidents of mass acts of violence against the oppressed black members of America's society that caused embarrassment to the nation, probably affecting world trade as well, to bring an end to the barbaric cruelty so long endured. Money does talk. Anyway, Three years after I'd burst in upon the Chicago music scene at the end of my second performances, I had a few weeks open. Audition was booked in Chicago as a pianist and backup singer for Ken, a singer-guitarist to perform in Winnipeg, Manitoba at Beef Eaters, which was a kosher Jewish-run restaurant on the lower level of the Dayton Building on Osborne Street near Maine. Ken had gotten my name from the Musicians' Union and arranged to meet my mother and I because the legal age of consent back then was 21. So even though I was 19, I was still legally underage. Mama was also impressed by the sharp-looking, well-dressed older musician, gave me permission to accept the gig. See, there's an old expression black parents used, don't do as I do, do as I say do. Got the picture? We were booked at Beef Eaters, a kosher Jewish-run restaurant, which was on the lower level of the Dayton Department Store building on Osborne Street near Maine. We arrived in Winnipeg during the height of a winter snowstorm and checked into a highway motel. The next day, when we were to start working the gig, Ken tried to book us later in the old CN Hotel on Main Street off Portage Avenue, but blacks were not allowed to stay there as guests. The only blacks that stayed in that hotel during those days were black railroad porters whose rooms were in the basement, period. Meanwhile, Ken and I went to the gig and got set up. There wasn't a dressing room, and we were told not to sit down at the table. During that time, Winnipeg, Manitoba had a general population of well over 600,000 predominantly white residents and approximately 300 black families living in the city. It would be at least two weeks into that gig that Gladys Balsley and Reg, who played vibraphones, would invite us to sit in on the first of many jazz sessions they held in their basement recreation room. In fact, it was the only place in town for musicians to hang out in, after hours on the Saturday nights. American acts would perform in the leading clubs or for special events, and after the gig they would hang out at Gladys and Reg's place. That first night, I met the great Sarah Vaughan upstairs before I headed downstairs to their recreation room with all the music action. She and Georgia stayed upstairs playing cards. Then I saw my old Chicago friend bassist Richard Evans, backup chess record studio musician and educator. We'd met in the music hall at Wilson Junior College where we were both studying music. I'd gigged with sax whiz Eddie and him for the past. Both Richard and Eddie were my sources of inspiration, introducing me to the Chicago jazz scene. I first sat in with drummer Roy Haynes, band leader, pianist Jack Shapiro, who had his own CBC TV show, the show that Jack built, replete with 16-piece orchestra, thank you, 
also sat in with them for a time. He was secretary of the Winnipeg Musicians Union, but later became infamous for lifting $50,000 from the union's bank coffers. After having served prison time, Jack tried to redeem himself upon release by paying back the monies as well as donating his time to community efforts and union uh, association methods. But Jack had featured me as a guest artist on the Bobby Sharon TV show around the second time I returned to Canada. He later hired me to perform on a couple of his CBC TV specials, the show that Jack built. Reg and Gladys invited Ken as a matter of courtesy to join us on the sessions, which he declined, thankfully, because even if he was black and from Chicago, from my perspective hometown, he belonged to the All God's Children Ain't Got Rhythm set. That first section was totally pleasant surprise because I was in my element. See, the clubs in Winnipeg back in the day didn't have jazz per se, so you had to play what was on the hit parade. Not only did I play jazz, but show tunes, standards, blues, and Latin jazz, plus a couple of polkas and chartiches dance pieces for the locals. However, as I said, my job was strictly to back up the leader, Ken. Before our gig ended, Gladys asked me if I would like to come back to Winnipeg to perform again. The following year, she booked me into the Constellation Room. Later, I played one of my return engagements at the Club Morocco on Main Street as a singer backed up by band leader saxophonist Al Sprintz and his band with accordionist Cass Seawick, drummer Del Wagner, bassist Bob Jackson, band members. The main spot for jamming back in the day was the Big A, a Cinnaboyne hotel on Saturday afternoons. Al Thumbler was the leader of the house band. He couldn't read a note, but he was a nice cat. Got the gigs and he paid me on time, so he was a friend. Switching to 1968, I had first performed on CBC TV singer on the Jack Shapiro show. The program featured the four lads and other internationally known recording artists, including singer Bobby Sharon. Later, I played gigs in the local clubs, leading with my trio and featuring Jimmy McEachern and Dave Drew on bass and flute. Ray St. Germain, singer Yvette Shaw, and I were booked once again by producer Ron Cantor to perform original creations for a show called, well, you guessed it, The Originals. The music for that show was arranged by conductor, composer, and pianist Vic Davies with Ed Phelps on tenor sax. Ed Badum, t trombone, Frank Stoney Burke, trumpet, trombonist Bill Brandt, saxophonist, and uh, bassist Dave Drew and Billy Graham, on drums. Ray St. Germain, well-known Canadian country singer and recording artist with whom I perform on TV as a special guest and also sung back up with the Milk Chocolate Trio. Oh, shut up. Two of us black girls and a white girl. For another Ron Cantor produced CBC TV show. Back in Chicago, after the race riots began taking place, gang members would occasionally take the odd pot shot at subway trains crossing the tracks overhead near my parents' home. I didn't want to race my kids in that violent atmosphere, and so I decided to return to Canada. We lived about five or six blocks just west of that area. My daughter turned four years old just two weeks before. You could literally feel the racial tension in the air. Armed troops patrolled our area, and the National Guard was bivouacked on the lakefront near the grounds of my favorite museum. And I literally feared for the lives of my children and family after the powder keg of anger began spilling out into the streets of my hometown. So, once again... 
Gladys Balsley booked me in Winnipeg at the Osborne Village Inn. But don't think for a minute racism didn't exist in Winnipeg. It was just not acknowledged because it was alive and well. Because I happen to remember when blacks, Jews, and native citizens were either not allowed in some sports club, nightclubs, and restaurants, or they were made uncomfortable right up to the 1980s. Because I played in a prominent club one New Year's Eve with Bob Day, a brother from New York, Dave Drew, and Wayne Fanukian on drums. Their wives and I were served cold food after midnight in another room across from the reception room with the doors closed. I couldn't eat. I was so disgusted. Back then, there was no uh, recourse to discrimination. You didn't make waves. Well, now, wouldn't you know the old adage, what goes around comes around would become apropos in what would nearly become the catalyst to that sports club's financial undoing, it so happens that the same sports club management literally begged me to perform there regularly several years later. There was no legal recourse. However, after the club's management counted the pennies they had raked in through ticket sales from our performance at the event, and the customers, who were mostly my fans, had praised us so much that I was literally begged to return as the house band. Naturally, they spoke first to the male drummer because he was the leader, but also they were sexist. So I purposely took other lesser paying gigs to avoid lying about my availability. The club management was so persistent that I deliberately raised my price so high they couldn't afford to hire me. Today, that same club that previously refused membership and admittance based on color, ethnicity, or religion would take any members, no matter what country or ethnic background you come from. I guess, like I said, money talks. In fact, if you analyze the institution of racism in both Canada and America, it was always the basis of political and financial power for a white majority. 